Freund was. Um, today we'll be talking about some uh, some uh, PDE models in uh, in semi classical and semi relativistic quantum physics. This is a, a joint work with my uh, PhD supervisor Norbert Mauser and also with two colleagues, uh, Chang He Yang, who's a PhD student with Thomas Howe at uh, Caltech, and Pierre Germain, who, uh, who is a professor at uh, Imperial College in London. Um, so how can I? OK, so uh, I have here a graphic which represents the most important models uh, in, in this setting. So I'll be talking about self-consistent models, which means that these models describe self-interaction with the electromagnetic field. Um, so each time you have a charged particle which moves, the, the movement will create a radiation um, which will interact with the particle itself again. So you have a nonlinear interaction here, and this is described by, by self-consistent models. So the, the electromagnetic field is created self-consistently. Um, on the top here, you have the relativistic setting um, with, with Dirac equation and, and Klein Gordon equation. So the Dirac equation is for, for spin one half particle for fermions, and the Klein Gordon equation is for, for bosons. Uh, but in each case, there are coupled to Maxwell's equations, since Maxwell's equations are relativistic equations. Um, and so down here, this row goes like the non-relativistic limit, where in the middle we have semi-relativistic regimes where you keep terms up to order one over C squared or one over C. And on the bottom, you have non-relativistic limit. So in the non-relativistic limit, the magnetic field, for instance, disappears. Um, and you only have electric self-interaction, which is described by a Poisson equation. So this is also electrostatic limit. And on the right-hand side, you have the classical limit. So if your uh, small parameter h bar, which is the Planck constant, goes to zero, you, you arrive at classical models. And basically, there you have two types of models. You have either Vlasov equations, so kinetic models, or you have Euler equations, so fluid equations. This depends a bit on which method you choose to, to prove, to, to, to do the semi-classical limit. I will come back to that later. Um, so I will be concentrating on, on this bold models here, Pauli Poswell. Uh, so this Poswell is a kind of a tension between Poisson and Maxwell, because one over C uh, approximation of that. And because the approximation is static in the sense that there's no, uh, uh, the, the Maxwell's equations are replaced by a static equation, by, by Poisson equations. Um, all right. So uh, I'll give it to you. Uh, this is a quite uh, complicated looking equation. So um, I put superscripts h bar and c here to emphasize that this, these objects all depend on these two parameters, right? Um, so you, your uh, unknown is a two-spinner. So you have a function which sends into C squared. You have one component for the spin up and one component for the spin down uh, of the particle. Um, you have a Pauli equation here. So this is a Pauli equation is sort of a Schrodinger equation with a magnetic Laplacian, with an electric potential and with a spin coupling. So here, this B is your magnetic field, which derives from the magnetic potential. And the sigma is the vector of Pauli matrices. So this whole, so this whole thing is a two by two matrix, which encodes the spin coupling of the two components. <clears throat> um, and so these two equations here are the, the Poiseuille approximation of Maxwell's equation. So for instance, if you were in, a, uh, in, in Coulomb gauge, you would, you would have this already, uh, this Poisson equation for, for V, uh, but you would have a wave equation for A, and basically, heuristically, you would just drop the two time derivatives, uh, the, the, the second order time derivative, 
because it would scale with one over c squared. And as a source term, you just have the current density, just like a maximum. Uh, you can make this rigorous, uh, but uh, that's not the point of the talk here. So the uh, the uh, these two objects are what kind of characterize this. Um, so this model was established by by Nader and Ben Norbert, I think, twenty years ago, twenty four, three, something like that. Um, uh, so. These are things I already all said, um, so I can skip this actually. Uh, so in the in the in the like SQL now, I will just uh, set everything to one and just to just keep the plan constant because this is what we concentrate on in the semi-classical limit. And I will be concentrating on the three D case um, because there we have uh, actually a nice interpretation of uh, of the magnetic field, um, and also we have this. Um, equivalence between the Hartree nonlinearity, so the fundamental solution of, of the Laplacian in, in, in R3. Um, so just a brief overview on the analysis. You can get local opposedness uh, in sufficient regularity for if you use energy estimates. So here you get some uh, Sokolov exponent five halves plus epsilon. This is due to uh, Sokolov embedding when you when you have to estimate the because in the in the in the magnetic Laplacian you have a derivative of u a times rad u, and if you want to estimate this you need this uh, high Sokolov embedding. You can also establish weak solutions globally uh, in H one. Using something that's called parabolic regularization, where you add a dissipative term and you pass it to the limit. Uh, this has been uh, done by by Gu, Nakamitsu, and Strauss for the Maxwell Schrödinger system, um, and so you can adapt this to to this case. Um, uh, I, re I wrote here: one can improve this to to lesser regularity, but uh, it's not or, or worked out yet. Uh, but uh, I think it can be done. Uh, you can look at something like magnetic Strichers estimates. Um, and so the global world poses H1 is, is open. So, but this would be what you would expect for this to be the optimal regularity. Um, and why is it difficult? Because uh, you have to, and so at, at some point you have to estimate DTA, time derivative of A. But since A is given by a Poisson equation, you don't have that much control over the DT. Um, but uh, yeah. so this is the situation for the existence and uniqueness of solutions. Um, so just to put you in the picture, when you do the uh, non-relativistic limits, this is what you end up with, with the famous Schrodinger Poisson equation. So here you see you have no magnetic field here, just have a regular Laplacian. You have no spin term, uh, and obviously you have no equation for a um, because it doesn't even show up. Um, and also, you lose the description of spin. So before we had two components, now we only have one scalar wave function. Um, what happens with Schrödinger Poisson the semi-classical limit? So if you use uh, <clears throat> the Wigner method, which I'll explain later, you arrive at Vlasov Poisson, where you have a Vlasov equation with Coupled to a Poisson equation, so the, the potential V here is coupled to the to the density row by a Poisson equation. Um, this limit has been famously proven by Pierre Lulliance and Thierry Paul in 1993, uh, simultaneously with Peter Markovich and Robert Mauser, um, where they use the Wigner methods. Um, so the time. Uh, here is a famous paper by Pfeffer Moser uh, who proved global classical solutions of that, regardless of the such. Because you know, if you have a, uh, if you change a the sign, then you get going to gravitational self interaction. So when the when the interaction of the products is positive, um, if you use a say WKB, uh, you arrive at at Euler Poisson. Um, so you have a Euler equation. Uh, 
again coupled to a Poisson equation for, for the potential, um, proven by Zhang in 53 and Alessandro in 57. Uh, so here we have really electric self interaction. Another important item here is that there's no pressure in the Euler equation. Uh, if you just derive it from, from Schrödinger Poisson, as I wrote it uh, two slides ago, um, if you want to have a pressure term, then you have to, to include some, some uh, nonlinear interaction term in the Schrödinger equation. So this some sort of H, depending on this quantity, would have to be included, when going back, would have to be included here as another potential term. And then, then you have a pressure that shows up here. And so here there's a different, there's a great difference between the signs. So if you have a, a different sign here, you have uh, the model of gravitational self-interaction and these are very different cases. Um, so just briefly, I will tell you something about the Pauli Poisson equation. So there you would just uh, consider A here as an external quantity. So if you have a strong external field, you can justify it and drop out the, the nonlinearity for A. Um, and this is a equation which is much simpler than Pauli Poisson, obviously. Um, it's not a set, it's not a really consistent model uh, because not everything is one over C, uh, but it's still it's still useful to study. Um, obviously, you, you can easily get double well posts by saying H one here. Um, well, I shouldn't say obvious, but <laughs> um, but uh, how can you justify this more rigorously? So this is an idea. This is not proven. This is just conjecture. Um, so if you consider an n-body Pauli equation, right? You have n particles. You have a, a tensor product of n wave functions, and you define something like this. You define like a Hamiltonian, like an n-particle Hamiltonian for the Pauli equation, where you add this term here, uh, which is the Poulenc interaction. Then uh, in the limits and in the mean field limit and to infinity you should arrive at the Poisson equation because uh, in, the, in the Schrödinger case, Schrödinger, and by Schrödinger, you arrive at Schrödinger Poisson, right? Um, in 3D. Because this becomes the hard field linearity, right? This becomes a convolution with one over X. In 3D, this is equivalent to the Poisson equation. So something like this should hold for the Pauli equation. There's uh, difficulties here. For, so first of all, you have to do this for with magnetic fields. Um, you have to control this in a way. Um, but the, the more important difficulty is that the Pauli equation is a question for fermions. So fermions are characterized by anti-symmetric wave functions because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And so you would have to do a, a fermionic mean field limit where you would arrive, arrive at the hard fog equation or something like that. But then it's very difficult to, to control this kind of singular interaction. Um, there has been recent papers on uh, the fermionic mean field limit with Coulomb interactions by uh, Porta and Schlein and uh, Ademacher, I think, and, and uh, Sefirio, Pierre Sefirio. But this is like a very recent and also not, not that satisfactory because they have to post strong assumptions on the initial data. And so this is uh, actually quite interesting uh, question. Again, what are they exactly proving? Which, uh, so so which they, they would have no magnetic fields, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they would choose a, a slated determinant for the initial data. And they have to assume, I think, a pure state. Uh, and this pure state has to satisfy some assumptions, which are very strict, I think, but I don't know exactly. Okay. Um, I think I have enough time. Maybe I'll tell you a little more detail about how you would do this Wigner method, uh, because I suppose not everyone here uh, is familiar. Um, so, we will work in a density matrix formulation. This will be important later because we will have to work with mixed states. Um, so mixed states, uh, kind of hand wavy definition is a statistical ensemble of 
all the possible states this quantum system could be in. So each possible state is represented by a wave function, which we will label by a J, and which is assigned a certain probability uh, lambda J. And then you define this object. Uh, so in fact, it's an operator, which is a trace class, but it has a kernel, um, which we will use from now on, and this is defined like this. So you sum over all, there's infinitely many possible states, each weighted with a lambda, and you have this quadratic form here. <laughs> um, so obviously, because there are probabilities, they have to be positive, uh, and oops, they have to sum to one, and these uh, wave functions are orthonormal. And then you can derive a system for like an infinite system uh, from, from, from this. So we have a Pauli equation for each uh, uh, wave function. You have the two Poisson equations, but the sources are a bit different. So the sources are now the density. So basically the, the diagonal of rho, which is well-defined, you know, um, and similar for the current, you know, so you have to sum on all this. So what do you, excuse me? Yes. Sorry, this one from the n-body polyprop? No, this is something, oh, this is a very important uh, item I have to mention. This has nothing to do with an n-body system. This is just for, this is basically just for one particle, but the particle has different uh, possible, so you as an observer, you don't know the exact state, so you have to consider like an ensemble of states, statistical ensemble, each each one a possible outcome or a possible state of the system for one particle. So this is not this index J does not number the particles. It numbers the different possible states. It's an important distinction. Right? Um, so initially they are orthonormal, and after that they will put the dynamics in time. Yes. Yeah. And how to select the initial state? Well, the initial state is encoded here. No, and yeah, how could you say so this arbitrary autonomous state or L2? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just a this is just a, like a definition of what the density matrix has to be. After that, in this dynamic, there is still orthogonal in different this structure. This uh, Yeah, I mean the orthogonality is uh, is preserved. Yeah. So. So this linear problem. Is, Um, so, uh, what is the Wiener transform? The Wiener transform is if you take your density matrix and you change your variables to these uh, variables, what also called the bio variables, um, or center of mass and relative coordinates, uh, doesn't matter. You, 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 the, you, you, uh, you define this and then you take the Fourier transform to the kinetic variable psi. So this would be the kinetic variable in the Vlasov equation. Uh, and you, so you take the Fourier transform to that. And um, then you obtain a, fu a function, which is called Wiener transform, um, which was defined to be some sort of replace or quantum analog of a phase space density. But it cannot really be a phase space density because it uh, has negative values in general. Um, you can... Uh, remedy this a bit by by smoothing it by by convoluting it with with Gaussians in both variables. So then you obtain a non-negative function, which on the other hand doesn't have some good properties. So that this doesn't have the right moments, you know. So the density rho doesn't come out as the integral over this Fushimi function. Um, but it has one upside, namely that uh, the Wiener transform and the Fushimi function. If you take the semi-classical limit, and this is what you're interested in, you converge to the same object, to a non-negative measure, which you call the Wiener measure. So you're interested in the semi-classical limit, and there you see, okay, there I get a positive object. So this is already a good thing. Um, how would this look for the Pauli equation? So what you do is you use the von Neumann equation for the density matrix where H is your Pauli Hamiltonian, you do a change of variables, you do a Fourier transform to have to obtain an equation for the Wigner transform, right? So this, you can switch from this and, 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 and the Pauli picture back and forth. 
and you obtain something like this. It looks horribly complicated, but um, the, the important part here is that here you have a transport term. So this is already very good, you know. So this will converge to the transport uh, operator in the Vlasov equation. And the rest are all like terms which stem from the magnetic Laplacian and the potential. So here's, here's your electric potential, here's your spin term. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are all pseudo differential operators defined by this relation here. So you put here, you have some objects, you know, and you, you have to convolute with F and a Fourier transform like a CDO. And you have your equations for the potential stuff, right? And so now you want to pass to the limit. So how do you pass to the limit? So usually you want to do is you can't you can only do this in a weak sense, right? Um, and what you arrive at is a magnetic class of equation. So transport term, Lorentz force, so you have gradient B plus P cross B. Uh, so this is in, in the Schrodinger, uh, in the Schrodinger Poisson case, you, would, you wouldn't have a, a magnetic term here, right? And uh, also what's new compared to Schrodinger Poisson would be your equation for A, right? So, so this equation here, this combined with this in the classical limits becomes this. And because you're classical now, F is positive, is a phase space density, is the limit of the Wigner transforms, and you have the right moments, right? So the density is the first, zeroth moment, and the current density is the first moment, right? So you go from quantum Vlasov equation for the Wigner transform to actual Vlasov equation. Um, Excuse me, sorry, where's the A in the equation? Oh, the A is in the B, sorry. So B is, uh, yeah. B is the curl of the So in the beginning, I said mixed states, right? Uh, density matrix and so on. Uh, why not just you know do it in a pure, pure state, just like use a just use a regular wave function? And this is because of this argument here. Um, this is already encountered in the Schrödinger Poisson case. Uh, so this was already done in 1993. So you want to pass to the limit weekly or in the sense of distribution. So you, you go into, like say, uh, S prime. Um, <clears throat> and you you need you need like uniform H, uh, uniform boundedness in L2 of the Wigner transform, right? Uh, this, this, so uniform in H bar. So it should be uniform bound, it doesn't depend on H bar. So you have, you know, Cons conservation of the L2 norm of the Wigner transform. So you uh, you need your initial data of the Wigner transform to be uniformly bound in L2. But you can do a simple calculation like this. So if you take the uh, you know the the, the, the the trace of of of, of the density matrix squared, which is the same as uh, as summing over the squares of the probability, so the small L2 norm of this sequence. So this is controlled by the L2 norm of the Wigner transform. This is a very simple calculation. But you obtain this h bar to the third by scaling, right? By, ch by the change of variables. So this, is, this, this, is, this will be here too. And so now if you want this to be uniformly bounded independently of the h bar, you see that this has to be bounded uniformly. So, and if you now would multiply by h bar to the third, you would see that this quantity here, this small L2 norm, is bounded by h bar to the third. What does that mean? That if you also have the assumption that they have to sum to one and that they are positive, you see that you have an infinite number of these probabilities which are non-zero, 
right? So you couldn't have a case where, say, uh, lambda one is one and all the other lambdas are zero because then you cannot possibly fulfill this, right? Because then you would have one here and h bar and in the limit, this would become infinite and come down, right? So you have to have a distribution of lambdas which shrink in the classical limit. So you have to have a mixed state, right? Um, should mention that in, 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 in one dimension, you can work out pure states in a paper by. Measure measure yeah, it's a very convoluted way of phrasing what you just said. Yeah. Okay. Um, So uh, just briefly, you know, you 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 have some problems with the magnetic fields, you know, because what you want to do is you want to pass to the limit in S prime. So you take uh, a Schwarz function. And so this big F H bar stands for these terms in the Wigner equation, right? Um, and so if you take this, for instance, you have a kind of a difference quotient. And if you now let H bar go to zero, you need to control this in L2, right, locally, because, you, you, uh, uh, because you're in S prime. So locally, you want this to be in L2, because, you know, this H, uh, A H bar squared converts to A, uh, the original of A. And so by a, by a Sobolev and Holder, you know, you see you put, you put, uh, you put this in L12, over five by sub if you get a in L12 and the sums to one half here, so you you, you would have an L2 function. Uh, but this is not so easy to see for um for a given by this Poisson equation. Uh, you need some sort of estimates for rho and j by Lee Turing, for instance. But then again, you encounter difficulties because you know, for, for the Pauli equation, Lee Turing estimates are not so easily available because the Pauli operator is a bit difficult. Um, so this is a problem we have yet to circumvent, right? Um, you can, and this is a quite important observation. How much time do I have left, actually? 55 minutes. Okay. Uh, this is an important observation, which was discussed by Pierre Louis and Patrick Chirard already, like, uh, decades ago. So um, I, I defined the Ushimi function, right? Um, as, as a Gaussian smoothing of the, of the Wigner transform. And they converge to the same Wigner method. So if I'm just interested in the, in the classical limits, why don't I just look at the Ushimi function? Because there I can also define an equation, right? I just have to convolute the whole Wigner equation with Gaussians. And then you can see that if you use a slightly different definition of the machine function by coherent states, uh, you can you can impose another bound on the probabilities. So before I had the small L two norm, which should be bounded by some power of h bar, and now I have the L infinite small L infinity norm, right? So they should be uniformly bounded by h bar, and then you get also by a relatively simple calculation, you you obtain that the Hoshimi function is actually bounded in all LP sp LQ spaces from one to infinity. And uh, I saw here yeah, the, 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 the first function, right? And now it's I'm a bit lucky because now I don't have uh, to use, if I go back here, I don't have to put L2 log here. I can do whatever I want because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, here I can pair it with something which is an L infinity or something else, you know, and this significantly relaxes my requirements on how regular A should be. Okay. So to 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 uh, recapitulate what we just discovered, so you have a function, the weaker transform of the density matrix, which is something which converges to a classical object, the Bottas-Bugner method, right? Because you want to go from Schrodinger or Pauli or whatever 
to Vlasov. And in the limit, F solves in a weak sense, in a distributional sense, it solves the Vlasov equation in the Pauli case with Lorentz force and the Lorentz force couples to the to the equations for the electric fields. So mm -hmm. in the nonlinear case where A, there have you have some technical problems here, um, which are not yet solved. Um, but you can we we try to to do this way via the Hoshimi function. So you, you cannot pass to the limit the Well, not so simple, yeah. Yeah. Because this is more more delicate than just a Poisson. Poisson uh, for V is very much. So uh, so here you would have it for poly Poisson, right? You would assume some initial regularity for your magnetic fields. Uh, this is needed for the in, when you want to use magnetic leap Turing estimates, right? Um, but since this A is external in the Pauli Poisson case, uh, get this away here. And so in the Pauli Poisson case, A is external, so we can choose whatever we want. You have an initial, initially bounded sequence in L2, uh, and then you 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 get you get a weak limit for your Wigner measure, right? Which solves <clears throat> the Vlasov magnetic Vlasov equation with Lorentz force. So B is external here. Is sort of a distributionally <clears throat> and if we want to put a conjecture for the poly plus well, well, uh, you would have to use this new condition where you bound this uniformly and you you trans you transform everything into shimi. And use this, you know. So instead of L two, you have L infinity here, and you hope that this will still solve it in the distributional sense, right? So I will depose on the probability distribution stronger assumption. Would it help for the model the chain states? Well, I mean, I mean, these these are already stronger assumptions, right? Uh, for for she. Mm -hmm. You mean for you mean for you mean for 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 the Wigner transform? Uh, yeah, not not for the Vlasov case, but the other. But we have that uh, minus regression a. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, so I can't really if I use Wigner here, I can't really put any stronger assumptions on it okay. because I don't have conservation of LP. For p greater than two, you know, only for two, I have it. That's why the idea is to change to switch to machine. Um, I'll skip over this. Um, and now just I will turn to the other uh, method to to prove semi classical limits where you, where you arrive at Euler equations. Um. So. The WKB ansatz is to, you know, have initial data like this. You know, you have a phase, uh, you have an amplitude. Um, so here in this case, by the way, we have a two speedor, so two components, but we we make a, an assumption, a simplifying assumption that both components have the same phase. We don't have so this S is the same for both components of the speedor. Uh, this is. <clears throat> I mean, this is a physical assumption. This is also a technical assumption because otherwise you could you have like cross terms, you know, between these two phases, which could be nasty and oscillate. Right? You can define your uh, density rho, your uh, velocity v as the gradient of the phase. You plug this into your equation, right? This is the standard stuff. Um, actually, uh, this is related to the Wigner measure. So if you take a monosynetic uh, Wigner measure, so which looks like this, so you have a density and you have a Dirac delta, yeah. <laughs> so where you, your velocities you know, are uh, localized, um, then if you, if you plug this into the Wigner equation, you get actually the WKB equation, right? And so 
uh, you hope that this um, stays the same. But all this is just local because there are singularities which may arise. Um, but so if you plug this in, you know, you get an equation. So here you, are, you already see that you have some sort of magnetic uh, velocity in a way. Uh, you have a uh, Gallatin here. Um, <clears throat> so this will become the equation for density in the Euler equation. This will become the equation for the velocity. You transform your potentials. Mm -hmm. um, you have some quantities, you know. Then you uh, hope that you have a priori estimates which bound this. And that you can test the limit, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what you arrive at in, in so in this form it's with the potentials, but maybe more familiar would be in this form with the uh, fields actually. So if you define your electric fields, your magnetic fields, transform this a bit, you you get this form, right? You get an Euler equation which is now coupled to a semi-relativistic approximation of Maxwell, uh, right? So in Euler Maxwell, so you would have full Maxwell equations here, but here it's only the, plus, the possible approximation now in field form. Mm -hmm. So here this would just transform these equations here into this. Uh, there's one thing here, actually, which is a bit tricky from the modeling point of view, because this is actually not really a one over C model, because you have the Lorentz force here. And the Lorentz force is one over C squared, second order in this parameter. So actually you don't really have a one over C model. And actually if you do Euler-Maxwell and you just do a, a formal asymptotic expansion of Euler-Maxwell, then in the first order, you, you don't get a, a Lorentz, a, a magnetic force term here. So there's just E, and then you see this decouples actually, right? The, the dynamics in the magnetic field decouple. But since we, in, in this situation, when you arrive from the semi-classical limit, you still have a Lorentz force, right? So this is a bit strange, but uh, it stems from the fact that in your magnetic Laplacian, you actually have a second order term, right? This is when you when you you when you take a, you take so there's one of the C here in the magnetic Laplacian, you take the square, there you have a second order MC term. All right. Um but uh, this uh, makes more sense, you know, if you do a one of a C squared mm -hmm. formal approximation of uh, a sort of expansion, so, sorry, of Euler Maxwell, then you can couple Euler to Darwin, right? So you still have Euler equations, you have Darwin approximation where you split your electric field into a transversal and the longitudinal component. So the transversal component is divergence free and the longitudinal component is related to rotation free. Um, so this is now consistent in one over C squared. But by the way, uh, also here we, we have unipolar models, right? Usually you would have, or like Maxwell, for instance, you would have bipolar models, like you have uh, two species of particles, you have ions and electrons, for instance. Um, and then you can do different limits with that. You can do a zero electron mass limit where the, the mass of the electrons goes to zero or the mass of the ions goes to infinity. And then you can go from a bipolar model to a unipolar model. But in the semi-classical limit, we, we automatically arrive at a, at a unipolar model, right? And again, you know, there's no pressure here, which is what I explained earlier. You would need to include some sort of interaction term at the quantum level to, to have a pressure term. So in, in a sense, this is a simplified Euler model, right? Good. Uh... Okay, this is the theorem. Uh, and you need to assume relatively high initial data because you need control 
uh, sublevel embeddings and so on, but then you get relatively straightforwardly, you get a solution locally in time, strong solution local in time, and you just pass the limit, you know, in the in the norms. Um, and you get your convergence of your beta transform to, to a monocinetic mean number. Uh, so this is joint work with Norbert and Chang He uh, Chang He Young. Um so this is this is oh this is the distribution <clears throat> so, well then you don't have uh, you need you need at some point you need to control or something like uh, uh, something like red you infinity you know uh, or even more than that and then you then you have to estimate this by uh, h might have something right and uh, because it's more than seven half because there's not another technicality in there but this is how you you need you need to you need to estimate uh, the gradient of human and infinity at some point because of the because of the uh because of uh, why did I write it down? Uh, because of this equation, right? So if you want to have some estimates on you, you need to. But physically, is there, is there a problem with access like Physically, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Really, this is just a uh, just a standard way of proving these things. Um, so. To to summarize uh, this this talk a bit, um, so we have seen uh, conjecture for the convergence of to, uh, this Pauling Coswell one over C approximation of Dirac Maxwell to a Vlasov Coswell equation with Lorentz force, or of the Pauling Poisson model to a Vlasov Poisson equation with Lorentz force. Um, we have seen that we need magnetically Turing estimates, which is an obstacle really uh, in the in the in the analysis. Um, we've seen that in, 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 in space dimensions <clears throat> bigger than two, uh, we need mixed states if we want to have some sort of uniform L2 bounds and FH bar. If we switch to the Hushimi function, we need uniform L infinity bounds, but this also implies mixed states, right? In both, in both cases, we stick with mixed states. Uh, and so, I mean, in, 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 in the end, the, the big question is the Dirac Maxwell equation. So, what is the semi classical limit of Dirac Maxwell, which has been an open question for, for years now? Um, but the Dirac Maxwell equation runs into its very own problems with negative energy and, and stuff. Um, so, we try to improve from, from a very simple model in a way, from a non relativistic level to a consistent semi relativistic model like Pauli Poisson, you know, because the, the Pauli Poisson equation is still, you know, really not that consistent because there's term, term is missing, right? You have, you, you don't have the magnetic self interaction. So it would be really nice to have this semi-classic limit of Pauli Poiswell uh, to have like a real extension of this model. So, so one level above, you know, uh, the WKB, thing is quickly summarized, you just do a big WKB ansatz, you arrive at the equation, you prove local strong convergence to other mm -hmm. that's it. Um, the problem is that the physicist that Yeah, it's it's relativistic loss of maximum. Uh, you 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 have a Blasov equation. Um, so where your velocity is not so in, in the in the in the in the non-relativistic setting, your velocity is just linear. But in the relativistic setting, it's uh, one over one plus uh, c squared, like this, right? 
So you just take Vlasov with this velocity and couple it to Maxwell. And this is an equation that we studied a lot. You know, there has been global solutions by the uh, alliance and you know, but the limit from Dirac Maxwell to there, no idea. Uh, so what is the program for future? Uh, what what do we want to do? Mm -hmm. We want to improve the world closeness. Mm -hmm. Um, we want to look at the semi-classical limit. There are some ideas, you know. We need some compactness in, in the sequence when you want to pass to the limit. There's some stuff about Aubin Lyons. There's an idea that I uh, had together with Francois Gauls, which I'm pursuing with him on an independent uh, setting, basically. So um, in, in, in kinetic equations, there is an important uh, observation, which is summarized under the term averaging lemma, which is if you if you average over the velocities in the Vlasov equation, then you uh, uh, then you have actually more regularity than than alone, you know. Uh, and so, if uh, if that happens, you can get a, a, a compact sequence, you know. And so, this would be interesting in this case because if we can prove some sort of velocity momentum velocity averaging for the Wigner equation, which is a quantum Vlasov equation, which has a transport term, right? then this would be another way to pass to the limit because then you have a compact sequence uh, and, 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 and you're good, right? So this would be an interesting question. So, but for now, we, we only look at, um, <clears throat> at the at linear case, even, you know, with, with external potentials, no magnetic fields and whatever, but this is a uh, work in progress with Francois. Um, you know, and then, uh, why not try to to improve the mean field limit of, of n body Pauli to to justify this this Pauli Poisson model? Uh, but uh, yeah, there's not not really much done uh, by by now. Um, yeah, um, and obviously you want to to study these new models here, Euler Poisson Pauli models. So here there is a collaboration with with uh, from a PhD student of of Thanos Thanos at Kaust. Uh, Nuno Alves, who is now a postdoc in Vienna, and we look at these models to, you know, analyze these uh, zero electron mass limits, uh, quasi neutral limits, study these equations a bit, see how they, you know, behave and whatever. Um, yeah. So this is the these are the projects. Um, so this is. Some, I don't think you're interested in that. Not really. Yeah, I think that's that's the conclusion uh, of my talk. And thank you very much for your. Do you, do you have questions? Okay. Always, if there are no questions, it's either the talk has been very understandable or not understandable at all. <laughs> I hope it's the first. Right, maybe does, does someone in the chat have a question? Well then, uh, <clears throat> good. Well then, thank you again and uh, Okay, let's, uh, oh, oh I can still open the PDF if you like. Oh, yeah, but just to see if there are. Yeah, but if you go back, you go back just to the problems. Okay. Which one of these do you think is more doable? Well, this is impossible. <laughs> uh, so funnily enough, there has been some sort of trick, you know, how you can get from the like Maxwell to Schrödinger Poisson. They prove first the non-relativistic limits to, and then you go from Schrödinger Poisson to Vlasov Poisson, you know. Uh, so 
you can get you can get like in the first diagram you know you can get from from very up here to down there but the question the interesting question is really how can you pass to the semi classic mm -hmm. how can you pass to them in this small parameter h bar um i think this these two are pretty much they should be doable you know uh, so at least here in the Wiener Poisson case, this should be possible, I think. Um, and I think this is also uh, not very far away, you know. Um, this I also think is doable. Um, I don't know if it's possible, if it's very easy in H1. Because I know I know there's a paper on Schrödinger Maxwell. So the, the history of Schrödinger Maxwell is, you know, there's, uh, because Schrödinger Maxwell is very similar, um, obviously. Um, there has been just energy estimates, and then what we talked about uh, yeah, two days ago, something with, you know, you have some smoothing estimates, you can get down to some, something above H1. And then there's a paper by, uh, by Tataru, where they prove uh, the H1 well postness of Schrodinger and Maxwell, but this is a horrible paper with very, very complicated techniques and uh, using a lot of the dispersive properties. It's very complicated. I don't know. If it's really worth doing that for for this model, um, and I think this is also very very difficult. Um, so these two I think are the most difficult, uh, and the rest this should be all doable, and this is you know very open. Can just to get the poisonous result to the picture. Hmm? The poisonous result. The poisonous. Uh, well, uh, hmm, I don't know. I think certainly below H one. It's it's probably ill post. But you can go really below or you can get <clears throat> well, I don't think I don't know. I don't think so. I don't even know if someone has looked at this for, for the Schrödinger Maxwell model, which is certainly the more famous one. Uh I, I think the best that that, that is done there is is H1. It's convex integration techniques and PMP techniques. Well, I don't know a lot about so them. Yeah, maybe. I mean, in the end, these models, these results are all just, in the end, they are just uh, fixed point arguments, right? And personally, I think this could be very interesting, not because of Pauli, but because the question of fermionic mean field limits with Coulomb interactions are interesting with or without magnetic field. So, but again, I think this is this is very hard. So in your very first slide, the, the mean field limit, uh, where, is it going up, up, to, up to where? If you go back to the very yeah. first slide. So you have the, the diagram. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah. So mean field limit is known up where so it is it is known here yes for bosons for bosons it's really pretty general and for fermions it's a little bit known like this very recent research for this uh but at least for the linear case it's known for bosons also uh, which is a kind of you just you just use some magnetic estimates to control the magnetic part, and it should be doable to just add the Poisson part here, so uh, and and do it for bosons. It should be just like a combination of this result and, and this result. So I think these are known. I'm not sure about this actually. I don't know if there's anything. This is what we want. What we yes. want to do. I mean, you can you can cheat in a way. You can say, okay, I do this just for bosons, even though it makes no sense uh, physically. You know, there's no Pauli equation, but maybe there's a justification <clears throat> how you could, you know, maybe maybe you can maybe you could approximate the fermionic dynamics by bosonic dynamics. I don't know really, um, and the rest obviously. Can I ask the questions? Uh, may I have an elaboration about the quantum infrared lemma in the, the last slide before the reference? Oh, ah, yeah. Uh, Is so, it related to the positive functions? Uh, well, not really, actually. The point why you would look at, uh, at uh, um, 
maybe I have the slide still. Uh, While well, you would look at uh, quantum averaging lemmas, is the reason that so this is your Wigner equation. You know, forget forget about all this here. But the important thing is you have this transport operator here, right? So this is sort of an equation where you might think you could do some averaging, right? You, you can use the structure here, and then you just have to control these terms. You have to control this operator. And then you, you get that, uh, you know, depending on the regularity of your potentials, you get that F H bar is actually in say H one half or H one fourth. And then you get compactness in L2 and you can pass the limit in H bar, right? So, so this is the reason why you would want to look at these averaging lemmas. Uh, but in the full generality, of obviously, this is, this is still not known. Okay, more questions? Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Well, there's something in the chat. Oh, no, so it's just a thanks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was excited or not? <laughs>